Presidente, vamos, vamos a comenzar el eh, bueno, Ahora presentas al profesor Jordi Freire Costa, el, 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 el texto en inglés y el vídeo a Michael que lee problemas a tu tablet. Michael va a leer un texto, más un texto de derecho de antiguo, o sea, el sol está apenas de esa identidad, está de leer un texto de derecho de antiguo. So this paper is written by Jurandir and Roy Richard Grinker, who is from George Washington University, professor. It's called Autism and First Person Accounts, Philosophical and Linguistic Reflections on Metaphor and Embodiment. So I will begin. In their recent edited volume, Worlds of Autism, Davidson and Orsini <laughs> draw attention to the extreme diversity of human thought and experience now included under the label autism. The authors underline the growing desire to learn about autism from self-advocates, in large part because their representations of themselves challenge many of the assumptions about autism that scientists, clinicians, and educators continue to reproduce. These assumptions derive from the search for commonalities along the wide-ranging spectrum of autism and revolve mainly around absence and deficit. For example, the lack of a theory of mind, including empathy, and a central coherence deficit. Whereas in the past it was thought that people with autism could neither understand themselves <coughs> through the abstract framework of autism, nor offer any insights to the scholarly study of autism, there are today dozens of first-person accounts by adults and children who self-declare as autistic, parents who recount the experiences of autistic children, and also by some caretakers and scholars who published in a variety of forms such as blogs, poetry, essay, books, who, for, who contribute to furthering the narrative genre. Okay. 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 We seek to compare some of these first-person accounts with ideas commonly held by experts on the subject. First of all, we must make five preliminary observations. First, we sought to avoid the quarrel over the authenticity of accounts written with the aid of facilitated communication. The hypothesis of fraud regarding the text's authorship remains, but this does not negate the value of what was written about the lived experience. Second, we do not intend for these accounts to faithfully mirror the intrinsic nature of autism. To us, there is no essence or intrinsicality in this form of subjectification. This work seeks merely to better understand psychological expressions that bear a, quote, family resemblance in Wittgenstein's sense of the expression, by which we mean phenomena that may overlap, but as a group share nothing in common. Third, the narrated cases are far from representing all subjects who participate in the autism spectrum. Many of these, especially those who are most fragile, do not acquire the ability to communicate through personal linguistic expressions. The fourth observation concerns the limits of this type of narrative. First person's accounts have a similar structure in terms of their basic constituent elements. Recounting the experience of disquiet and suffering of parents, relatives, and the subjects, when faced with the first psychological signs of what would later be diagnosed as autism. Initial contacts with educational and therapeutic professionals and equipment, the disappointment in some cases with the routine way with which the problem is treated, the discovery of more creative and emotionally rich means of expression than those described or prescribed by the expert's body of knowledge. <coughs> Additionally, in nearly all accounts, subjects revisit narratives of previous experiences, adding new observations. Obviously, a typical style of first-person accounts has been created, which marks, delimits, and simultaneously enables the enunciation of the psychological pe 
peculiarities of this modality of human experience. However, we could say that the same happens with any implicit or explicit rules for communicating psychological experiences. In all of them, the imprint of the historical matrix of the many ethnic, religious, social, professional, gender, cultures or subcultures, of academic specialties, and so on, are inescapably present. We believe there is no way to escape the theoretical shadow of the vocabularies used to describe the autistic experience. In fact, even the person suffering from psychotic delusions draws on his or her knowledge experience in the world to generate them. Thus, to us, the fact that the accounts are a perspectival approach to the autism problem does not keep them from carrying refined and original observations on psychological processes, in addition to being confirmed by several independent accounts, deserve attention. Finally, our goal th is thus to illustrate through the language of people with autism how people construct their subjectivity and interpretive vocabulary. And in doing so, we're perhaps not far from much of psychiatric and psychoanalytic practice, which often relies on first-person accounts as evidence, even if clinicians also often deny that patient narratives can validate a diagnosis. We are approaching first-person accounts differently, however, to the extent that we draw on a non-medical vocabulary, namely literature and phenomenology. Ironically, in using philosophical perspectives to think about the unusual language of people with autism, we are performing our own estrangement from normal disciplinary practices in psychiatric research, and in autism research in particular. <coughs> Understanding the meanings of the autistic experience depends largely on understanding the unusual way in which subjects communicate live experiences to one another within their shared environment. These experiences are, in short, intentional states, processes, or occurrences, that is, needs, desires, thoughts, sensations, feelings, beliefs, judgments, actions, etc. The meanings of autistic expression may, for the purposes of argumentation, for, for the purposes of argumentative clarity, be divided into four major dimensions. Cognitive, sensory motor, affective, and communicational. We chose the four topics due to their tacit dialogue with traditional interpretations of the autistic experience, or in more scientific parlance, the broader autism phenotype. In conventional psychiatric nosology, so-called cognitive, affective, sensory, and communicational deficits are viewed as pathogenomic signs of autism. By communicational performance, we designate the set of physical, mental resources that enable the subject to render intentional acts comprehensible to another subject. These resources may also be described as the linguistic and pre-linguistic competence that it's necessary for the agent to produce in the interlocutor satisfactory or unsatisfactory responses to their demands, which may be conscious or unconscious clear or confusing, simple or complex. This includes cases described as social communication deficits, one of the most highly researched aspects of autism, and the subject of numerous psychometric tests, including difficulty expressing oneself, social reciprocity and turn-taking, and inability to develop meaningful relationships. By sensory motor performance, we des designate the physical expression of the body concerning the capacity to discern internal or environmental stimuli, ordering them in types or instantiations of types with cognitive affective value, and also the heightened sensitivities. Sensory motor performance enables us to selectively cope with things and events due to different inclinations, needs, beliefs, desires, <coughs> aspirations. By affective performance, we designate subject's ability to manifest emotion, feelings, or affections that are appropriate to different life circumstances. This includes all aspects of the debate on the empathy deficit that is supposedly characteristic of uh, autistics. Deficits in affective performance refers to the observations that 
people with autism exhibit flat or neutral emotional expressions, and moreover, exhibit emotional expressions that are unusual or socially inappropriate in given contexts. Each of these topics is extraordinarily wide-ranging, complex, and we do not wish to oversimplify them as features of autism. Nonetheless, they do represent major areas of behavior that clinicians construe as impairment and deficit, and are already simplified in diagnostic tests and in the DSM-5. We should also add that the, in the examples we will analyze, the four elements were isolated for didactic purposes. In intentional human conduct, they are inextricably connected. Given both the current stage of our research and the limits imposed by an article, we will focus on examples of cognitive actions. In future research, the other aspects will be analyzed. <coughs> Cognitive action, however, is not equivalent to mere intelligibility, if by the term we understand the capacity to competently use abstract arguments and thoughts, or the dominant ordinary language. Intelligibility, as Gallagher and Johnson and Lakoff, among others, show, is a component of more complex actions. Faced with this, we chose to analyze the issue of cognition in two of its main aspects. First, the hypothesis of the central coherence deficit, and second, the hypothesis of the inability to justify seemingly meaningless intentional acts. The first hypothesis typically refers to the tendency in people with autism to focus in their cognitive processing on details rather than the big picture or integrative gestalt. gestalt. We will seek with the help of examples to question the supposed automatic, unthinking character of these attitudes. As for the second hypothesis, we will likewise show, seek to show how autistic subjects' capacity to cope with objects and events in the world and to justify their beliefs, attitudes, or emotions rationally from a logical point of view and efficiently from a communicative point of view. To clarify the argument, we need to further discuss the notion of a central coherence deficit. Central coherence is a term coined by cognitivist theories to describe a supposed autonomous instance responsible for the subject's capacity to follow rules, based on systems of compulsory inferences. As Bicklin critically observed, this thesis is based on the idea that the autistic subject is unable to construct categories based on similarities and differences of the members of a logical set and to show interest in the whole and not only in part of a part of a phenomenon. And C, to derive patterns of behaviors of observed uh, facts from individual occurrences. So the intellectual aspect of knowing, of ascribing meaning to what one copes with, is evident. Subject's spontaneous capacity to structure the world based on the embodied action of perceptive interactions and sensory reactions is reduced to an almost theoretical, epistemological operation. This unsuccessful operation would be the bedrock of their supposed inability to deal with the logic of means to, suited to ends or to correctly infer satisfactory logical conclusions from consistent premises. This is the first assumption that render what autistics, autistic individuals think, say, or do apparently meaningless. The second one is that the autistic subject would be incapable of offering acceptable justifications for their actions, whether manifest or merely imagined. Going against this reading, autistic subjects show they strive to make others understand why they behave strangely, and that they are frequently capable of this kind of communication. In other words, cognition is more than just a disembodied process to be judged in terms of a shared understanding. As we note below, first-person accounts of autism show that autistic subjects know what they are feeling and seek to communicate it and to deny that rationality because it may not be shared by the average member of the autistic person's community risks more serious moral consequences, and grave theoretical errors. This view is not foreign to anthropology. Anthropologists have long validated a relativist perspective, beginning 
with uh, Evans Pritchard's classic account of Azande witchcraft beliefs as rational in quote context, nor is this view foreign to Freudian psychoanalysis in which the reasons a person gives to explain a behavior cannot be evaluated by shared cultural expectations about what is rational or reasonable, but must be understood in terms of how the ability to explain oneself structures one's psychological life. We would add to these comments on rationality the important ability for subjects not just to explain themselves, but to explain why they behave in a way that others interpret as strange. This ability is not trivial. It supposes an enormous cognitive effort, which is to translate into the hegemonic mental vocabulary the atypical experience, which is, at first glance, incomprehensible to most. So we're going to emphasize this last aspect of cognitive performance because we believe it is frequently underestimated in discussions of, of autism. So now we'll turn to some fragments of these accounts, um, starting with uh, Richard Atfield. Atfield was one of uh, Douglas Bilkin's uh, collaborators in his well-known work on autism. In one part of his account, Atfield says, and I quote, I'm not retarded. All my life I've been considered stupid. I understand that autistic people are intelligent, and if you people admitted that you cannot understand us, then perhaps we could try in a way to understand each other as fellow human beings." Close quote. The fragment speaks for itself. Hatfield is not only capable of understanding what, quote, understanding means, he's also capable of understanding the reasons why he was not understood by people around him. From the point of view of rationality, his thinking is at the level of someone who knows their expressive means, the expressive means of others, and additionally, can grasp in a broad gesture of moral openness the value in human beings' efforts to understand one another. All preconceived ideas of a central coherence deficit, a deficit of rational justification of the meaning of what is done, said, or thought, are seriously called into question by accounts of this sort. Um, next is uh, uh, Tito Muko uh, Padilla. Tito Muko Padilla. Uh, let's call him Tito. Uh, Tito states that um, once he was shown a toy, uh, he, once he was shown a toy tiger and was asked to name the object, he thought of many things associated with the tiger, such as carnivore, stripe ferocious, forest, hunt. But he could not come up with the name of the animal until he arrived at a method of naming it. Quote, a striped animal, which is not a zebra, is a tiger. Tito used the object's defined description, first in its positive form, a striped animal, then in its negative form, which is not a zebra, to then use the common noun as an indexer of singularization. He thus shows he can resort to an atypical, logical procedure that is nonetheless perfectly intelligible. He's therefore competent to generalize based on singular phenomena and to construct categories formed by elements with similar characteristics. <coughs> At other moments, he exposes the peculiar way of giving defined descriptions of common nouns. Flower, for example, is defined as, quote, a soft petal part of a plant is a flower. An elephant is defined as follows. A very big animal, which evolved from a mammoth, is an elephant. In this case, what draws our attention is not the classification logic, but the creation of new metaphors and metonymies. Describing flower as a soft petaled part of a plant, an elephant as a very big animal, which evolved from a mammoth shows the integrity of cognitive functions and the creativity of the chosen definitions. The originality of the definitions seems even more remarkable as Tito once said that, quote, the story behind an object is far more important to me than the object. That is why a description of a situation becomes more important to me than the situation itself. 
In other words, Tito is curious about the context in which words and expression, expressions gain meaning and feels the need to render them explicit in the act of defining. This background habitually goes unnoticed, as if the common noun were a tag affixed to a product. Only during times of controversy is the context, which originates the disputed meaning, brought to the foreground and subjected to the analytical de decomposition that Tito spontaneously carries out. Despite having an atypical interest, Tito's cognitive operations are totally understandable and translatable into our dominant logical vocabularies. Now to Daniel Tammet. One of the noteworthy things in Tammet's case is that contrary to common sense views of high performance autism or high functioning autism, I guess, his remarkable intelligence for numbers and language acquisition is not a mechanical activity. This is notable, among other things, in the justification he formulated to explain synesthesia. He states that synesthesia is a natural phenomenon that is potentially available to most people. In his case, the synesthetic potential is nearly fully developed. In support of his, this opinion, he turns to Ramachandra. This argument is interesting and deserves to be reproduced in full, so I'll, uh, I quote, we quote. Recently, Professor Ramachandran's team has replicated the results of this test using the invented words booba and kiki. 95% of those asked thought the rounded shape was a booba and the pointed shape a kiki. Ramachandran suggests the reason is that the sharp changes in the visual direction of the lines in the kiki figure mimics the sharp phonemic, phonemic inflections of the word's sound, as well as the sharp inflection of the tongue on the palate. Professor Ramachandran believes this synesthetic connection between our hearing and our seeing was an important first step toward the creation of the word in early humans. Quote, the propriety of this reading of Ramachandra on synesthesia is irrelevant. What is important is observing the improvisation in Tamit's cognitive operation. He creatively leads us to see the surprising naturalness of his sensory perceptive atypicality. He tacitly says that kinship with so-called neurotypicals is evident. There's nothing in his way of feeling and thinking that is deficient. Uh, next is Naoki Higashida. Higashida, in his account, discusses a relatively frequent behavior among autistics, repeating the same question several times. About this kind of perseveration, he says, quote, It's true. I always ask the same question. What day is it today? Or is it the school day tomorrow? I don't repeat my question because I didn't understand. In fact, even as I'm asking, I know I do understand. The reason why? Because I very quickly forget what it is I've just heard. Inside my head there really isn't such a big difference between what I was told just now and what I heard a long, long time ago. I imagine a normal person's memory is arranged continuously, like a line. My memory, however, is like a pool of dots. I'm always picking up these dots by asking my questions so I can arrive back at the memory that the dots represent. Now let's observe two characteristics of his account because they will be repeated by almost all authors of the accounts we analyze. Firstly, he diagnoses the cause or reason of his expressive particularity and leads us to see that the supposed echolalia or linguistic stereotyping is a meaningful act. Second, he explains the peculiarity of the mimetic function dynamic fun function, uh, functioning, comparing the images of a container to discuss storing memories with the unusual image of a path, a progressive line in time, which could be the standard image of recollection. Higashida's cognitive performance is undoubtedly exceptional, though atypical. So back to Tito and, Sean, and now Sean Barron. The following examples once again show the author's ability to rationally justify the meaning of behaviors they recount, even from a pragmatic point of view. 
Tito and Sean used to turn light switches and electro electrical appliances on and off repeatedly, which disoriented and sometimes annoyed their parents. Quote, in Sean's account, he states, I loved repetition. Every time I turned on a light, I knew what would happen. When I flipped a switch, the light went on. It gave me a wonderful feeling of security because it was exactly the same each time. Tito offers more than one explanation for his similar behavior. He explains the compulsion for turning light switches on and off as follows. As I did my work with the switches, it gave me a feeling of great triumph, as if I was holding the reins of those dark, bright, dark moments in my hands. And those moments confronted me by their predictability. He then states that the switch's rhythmic movement enabled him to better understand what is happening in his environment and ask the following question. And why should comprehending the environment become less fragmented if I turn the switches on or off? I would just see one aspect of the environment, the illuminating aspect, with a controlled probability of either bright or dark. After controlling my visual senses, I would be able to eliminate other visual distractions, like shadows, reflections, and the movement of the blades of the fan. Quote. At another occasion, he answers the question about the role of rules and routines in his everyday life, stating that, quote, rules are somewhat the very proof to an autistic person that he exists. I'm no exception, and I get a sort of self-existing sense when I have followed a routine set of activities. But if I decide to switch on the lights at midnight and wake up the whole house by playing my tape recorder, just because I want to find my identity, I need to be stopped. Observe their capacity to offer diverse causes and reasons to behaviors that at first glance are nearly indistinguishable. Sean justifies the stereotyping of flipping the light switch on and off with the desire to find everything around him in exactly the same place. Undoubtedly, his gesture is atypical, but cannot be classified as stereotype. If by stereotyping we mean mechanical movements with no meaning, a movement that seeks to create conditions for the subject to have the experience of constants, permanence of the vital environment is anything but meaningless. In addition to explaining his similar behavior through the same impulse of predicting future occurrences as a way of reassuring himself, Tito also offers two other justifications. In the first, the repetitive gesture is interpreted in an extremely inventive way. By controlling the illumination, he controls his horizon of vision in order to only see an aspect of the environment, eliminating other visual distractions. This cognitive strategy is similar to the scenic rhetoric of theater spectacles. The use of spotlights allows the director to manipulate illumination so that the spectators fix their attention on an aspect of the plot that he hopes to highlight. And the second justification, the gesture's repetition is not explained by its function as a filter for the environment's sensory stimuli. The behavior's meaning is not to order the environment's elements, but to strengthen the experience of recognizing one's identity. <coughs> Additionally, even though he understands how important it is to attain this goal, Tito agrees that at times others should stop him. This statement shows that his cognitive performance is even more complex than what we may have believed. Since it incorporates into explanatory, into explanatory dynamics the variable inconvenience to others, this addendum will be further explored in future work on affective and communicational performances. Stephen Shore. In Stephen Shore's example, the cognitive device is used as a, in an original way. In discussing his compulsive tendency to mimic his brother's gestures and ways of speaking, he says, quote, Perhaps I had difficulty seeing myself as an autonomous being, separate and distinct from my brother. Quote, Once more, the attempt to understand what is happening shows the subject's capacity to acknowledge how strange his behavior is and to justify it with arguments that are logically and culturally plausible. More than that, being aware of the possible lack of distinction between oneself and the other 
and articulating this phenomenon with the compulsion to mimic shows great intellectual dexterity. Addressing one's own self in diverse situations as an object to be described demands a, cognitive, a complex cognitive effort. Experiences of agency or authorship or self-awareness or self-knowledge, all implied in everyday actions, have to be broken down so they can be cognitively transmitted. Expressions such as seeing myself, autonomous being, separate and distinct, presuppose a level of abstraction that is incompatible with the idea of a central coherence deficit. Now finally, Sean Barron. Another example of atypical non-deficient cognitive performance is presented by Sean Barron. Sean had two compulsive habits that annoyed his mother exceedingly. The first was repeatedly throwing pencils <coughs> at the house's heater. The second was throwing objects at a tree without bothering to find out if the objects belong to people who may not have wished that they be thrown out. In both cases, Sean was satisfying a kind of curiosity regarding ballistics. His interest consisted in observing possible patterns that could appear repeatedly when he observed the time and speed of ascent and descent of objects thrown against a rigid target, situated at different heights or and distances from the thrower. Sean's reaction to his mother's reproach is perhaps morally condemnable, but perfectly intelligible if we look at it from the perspective of self-interest. Sean claimed that in repeating his gestures, he felt great satisfaction because, quote, this was my world and I had control over it. I controlled the object. I went up to the top of the tree because I made it happen. And if the thing I threw belonged to someone, that didn't concern me, and I had nothing to do with it. When I was called names and punished, I felt invaded. I was no longer in control. Someone had control over me. The conduct's, the conduct's intelligibility is evident. The context of meaning may seem extravagant, but once redescribed, becomes absolutely justifiable. This taste for patterns, routines, repetitions is understandable if we consider these are all instruments for stabilizing the subject's identity and the environment in people with a fragile sense of unity of self. In conclusion, the examples could be multiplied in order to illustrate the diverse facets of intelligibility, intelligibility or meaningfulness present in the conduct recounted by the authors of these accounts. We would thus prefer to end this text with this elegant citation from a text by Yoshe Selen, quote, it's in English? It's nicer in French, but okay. Uh, I would also like to show the autistic absurdities, but I will interpret them and explain them to people, because each absurdity has a deep meaning as everything. By us, everything has meaning. Our world is not sunk forever into senselessness, as people suppose. Our world, on the contrary, is like a system of security antennas born of fabulous islands. And that is it. Michael, thank you very much. Do you know why I was anxious that it was him who read? He interprets the text. He's an actor. <laughs> I think this is a general question, but it was also very closely connected to your paper. Uh, the idea of what is autism, what is the autism we are talking about? Because I can think about in Swedish context, there's different kinds of autism. It's the traditional way of thinking about autism, which is more the canner version of autism. And then we have the more Asperger syndrome kind of autism, which is another way of thinking about autism. So when you on and on talking about autism and how perhaps presumptions of autism is kind of so crossed or disturbed by perhaps those stories you have been reading. I was thinking about what autism do you think about, if that makes any sense. And also, number two, uh, perhaps I stop with this one. Yeah, another question is, which 
which has the second, sorry, the second question is, is about the context. As you are in context, when you are reading stories which is produced in another context, so it's also been interesting to, to talk about this kind of traveling of narratives, because this is your narrative, and it's a narrative about a narrative in another context. That was just... So my question is about um, objects. It seems that in these narratives, uh, the main protagonists, the main people who are providing these narratives, are interacting with objects. And I wondered about sort of the, when thinking about affect and emotion, we always reserve that for interpersonal kind of and interaction, but it seems to me that pencils are important and zebras are important and um, and light switches are important. So is it is there something happening in this kind of uh, subjectivity that is born of um, human interaction with uh, material objects that people have been are writing about a lot about this sort of new materialism and blah blah blah. I don't know, I just keep kept thinking about that when I was reading. Okay. Okay. <laughs> You don't need to know what I say, they say that blah, 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 blah. pessoas que estão no que a gente pode chamar de uma ponta do espectro, né? And he also, and he also is aware that those people who wrote these testimonies are, are, are the people who are at the very end of the high function uh -huh. of the spectrum. Uh, the image of all that I have, mine, mine. Uh, when I look, uh, when I look for autism. Eu vejo vários autismos. When he looks at autism, he sees several autisms. É. Vejo Rayman. Né? Rayman type of Eu autism. Eu vejo o um, um charme de Hollywood. Which, which is uh, Hollywood glamour. É. Eu vejo uma, uma criancinha ou um adulto 
que não consegue o mínimo de expressão. And he also sees a child of an old, of a young man who cannot express it himself when they are very low functioning. Que pode ser muito bem cuidado na Suécia, no Canadá, na Austrália, na Holanda. Who can be very well attended in in the, in Canada, Australia, or Holland. E pessimamente cuidado no Brasil. Very bad taking care of in Brasil. Eu vejo esse panorama todo. This is all that landscape. He's aware of that landscape that there is not just one form, one type. Meu problema é como sendo um turista. His problem is how being a tourist. No universo, no país do autismo. In the country of the sun. Eu posso entender minimamente qualquer coisa sobre isso. He can minimally understand anything about that. Assim como quando eu cheguei na Rússia ou na Grécia. The, the, very, uh, uh, the very same way as when he arrives in Russia or Greece. Eu não entendia nada. He didn't understand the war. Eu sabia. Então, eu escolhi como guia. He uh, uh, chose as a guideline. Nessa viagem ao país do autismo. In the, in, the, in the journey, in the travel of autism. Esses personagens bilingües. Those bilingual characters. Esses autistas são autistas bilingües. They are by those autistic eles people. conhecem algo da língua do autismo e eles conhecem algo de nossa língua. He knows something about the language of autism and also about our, our language. E no nosso grupo de estudos, and in his research group, eu, Rosano, Ju, etc. He, etc. Rosano, and others, a gente costuma dizer que esses textos They, they used to say that those texts, those testimonies, são nossa pedra de roseta. Are there uh, Rosetta Stone? Porque tem é a capacidade da gente entender uma linguagem na outra. It's a capacity to translate from one language into the other. Quanto é, é isso? Quanto digamos a, agora um pouquinho avançando quanto ao tipo digamos nosológico por exemplo, o, o Richard Edfield, é, Richard Edfield. o Alberto Frugoni, Alberto Frugoni, eles apresentam aquilo que a gente chama de transtorno grave do desenvolvimento. Hipotonia motora, muitas motor vezes, hipotonia postural, Incapacidade, se você quiser, de sustentar a atenção por mínimo tempo. Incapacidade de que a atenção por minimal spot of time. É diferente de Daniel Temet, é diferente de outro. O Tito Muco Padiari também era um garoto muito, muito limitado desse aspecto. Tito was also very low functioning. Outros não. Others, não. Ainda hoje, Tito é um rapaz, ele tem sérias limitações. Né? Today, Tito has ele... limitations today. Eu conheço ele pelo Facebook. Ele não se conhece pelo Facebook. É. Friend. Tito. é. Então, você tem. Estou em contato. Agora, isso eu acho no que concerne a imagem que eu tenho de autismo, por que eu escolhi isso, né? A segunda pessoa. Why he has this image of autism and why he chose those accounts. Segunda pergunta sua sobre o contexto. About context, your second question. Em relação ao contexto, aí é uma questão de método. That is, uh, regarding the context, that is an issue of me a methodology, methodological issue. Vou explicar. Quando a gente faz descrição fenomenológica em psiquiatria ou psicologia when, when one make a, in, in psychiatry or phenomenology a description a gente neutraliza o contexto é, é, é one neutralize the context com a intenção the bracket, é, no bracket com a intenção with the intention no. com a intenção de ver a imagem de mundo que o sujeito está retratando trying to see what is the image of the world of the subject is performing the way of being in the world the way world they are in the world the way of being in the world desse aspecto eu poderia fazer uma análise dessa não é? é claro com essas pessoas do mundo anglo-saxônico 
he knows he could do one or one or one of those analysis with those with yeah. those person with those people that he knows are in, in the Anglo-Saxon Japanese one a war or some, sometimes in, in India. Japan India. Né? Posso fazer, como posso fazer no Brasil, né? He can also do it in Brazil. Eu acho que isso aí é o limite do método. That is the limitation of the phenomenological method. Mas é a riqueza do método. But at the same time is the rich rhythms of the method, so important is to be aware that, yes. that you have this. The whole time. Now, and Michael, I remember, he said, okay, Michael, about the objects. The object affects the emotion, Michael. Affects the emotion. It's the next step. It means to bring us into the world. Yesterday, I saw his conference, é. He, he had attend at your talk yesterday. Eu vi que você está ocupado com a emoção e depois eu tenho muito que trocar. He, <laughs> he, says, he saw yesterday that you are also working with emotions, so he thinks he has a lot of Mas agora, a change with you. About the objects. Uh, object, para mim, object é, significa a fortes means affordance in Gibson's in Gibson's, terms. In Gibson's uh, psychology. Object faz parte do mundo object, em que o sujeito se manifesta. Objects are a part of the world in which the subject manifests itself. Objeto é o sujeito externalizado. Object is the externalized subject. Parte do objeto contém a ação, a imaginação, se você quiser, e faz parte do mundo que estrutura a própria subjetividade. Part of the object. Não. Bom, fenomenologicamente. Fenomenologically. Fenomenologicamente, o objeto é necessário. Object are necessary. Para que o sujeito tenha consciência de si. In order that the subject have conscious of oneself. Não existe uma emoção dentro. There is not emotion inside the subject. Que seja expulsa e colocada no objeto. That it expels and placed in the in the object. A relação com o objeto. Relationship with the object. Vai estruturar meu desempenho emocional. It's going to structure to structure his emotional performance. E cada objeto. And each object. Me solicita de uma maneira particular. A forma. That is the meaning of a forma. It's always a forma. A forma solicita é é Interpela, ask me. Ah, é, já interpels him or ask him in a particular way. É, de uma maneira particular. O o que significa? O que significa que cada objeto é muito pessoal. Its object is very personal. É, mas significa a possibilidade que o sujeito tem de se exprimir melhor. It's a possibility for the subject to express himself in a better way. Na relação com o outro. In the relationship with another person. I have a question. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I make in English because for the. Ah, tudo bem. When I was listening to you, I I I remind of Emily Martin book on bipolar expedition, which you know and we read with our students. Why? Because what what Emily Martin does is to put to she makes an ethnography with with bipolar people in 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 self advocacy groups of bipolar disorder. Those people diagnosed with bipolar disorder they perform their own madness. So what they do in those groups is they are together, and I say, do you know what is to be bipolar? Is to be. I say so they are distancing of themselves. Why are they talking about their own madness? Those people think they are mad. They are gonna see how mad I am. Like, you know, so they have the same, the very same as that. So that's what I remind me because it's, it was the very same process. The people know exactly why they are doing what they are doing. So, but my question is that, Julian dear, of course that shows that they are central coherence, etc. But therefore, it's still atypical. It's still in the case of bipolar as well. A form of madness. So the way, just frame it in another way. The way a person with delusions is aware that he is in a delusional state, makes him therefore to be less schizophrenic in the case of psychotic. And, and I think that we could, we could do an analogy with with autism. Thank you. Well, I respond. 
Primeira questão. A primeira parte. É sobre o modelo de conduta. Eu repito o que o meu professor Jorge de Verônio dizia. O que o professor Jorge de Verônio disse. Existe modelo de conduta e modelo de desconduta. There is a conduct model and disconduct models. Ninguém é louco como quer. Now what is crazy as, the, as our math as they want. É louco como pode ser. It's crazy as they can be, as the ah. culture allows them to be. Se uma pessoa for louco de uma maneira muito esquisita, ninguém sabe que ela é louco. If somebody is crazy in a very, in a very strange way, nobody would know that he is crazy. Por exemplo, you can recognize him as Por exemplo, for instance, se eu for louco e disser, if you were crazy, I would say, ah, eu quero ser um homem de negócios. I want to be a businessman. Eu quero ser um winner. I want to see. I want to be a winner. Eu quero trabalhar em Wall Street. I want to work in Wall Street. Eu quero ter um apartamento de 30 milhões de dólares no Central a, Park. A 30 million apartment in Central eu, Park. Eu posso ser louco de rasgar dinheiro. I could be crazy as to as to just throw money away. Ninguém vai saber que eu sou louco. Nobody would know that I am crazy. Só quando eu quebrar a bolsa. Only when when I make the crackdown in Wall Street. O que acontece é que não existe livre, livre expressão do que a gente chama patológico. There is no free expression of what, of what one calls pathology. Na história da, da psicanálise, por exemplo, the history of psychoanalysis, a gente tem o caso das histerias de Charcot. We have the case of Charcot hysteria. As histéricas tinham ataques para que Charcot visse. The hysterics were performing their their attacks to get delusions in order to shut down the psychiatry. Yes, but it was just this that permitted Freud to discover the transfer. But that was enabled Freud to discover the transfer. Permitted Freud, inclusive, to know what is the pathoplasty of the hysteria. It enabled Freud to know what is the pathoplasty of the hysteria. The fact that these people identified with autism. The fact that those people identify themselves with autism as being autistic. E virem a se conduzir muitas vezes como o autista se conduz. And behave themselves in the way that 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 normally autistic people behave. Fenomenologicamente não anula o que a gente quer saber sobre isso. It doesn't annihilate. It doesn't phenomenologically annihilate what we want to know about them. Porque vamos supor no caso extremo. Let's imagine. A one extreme case. Que uma pessoa possa simular absolutamente, perfeitamente o que é ser um autista. Because in an extreme case, one can imagine the case of somebody who could exactly simulate at the perfection what is to be an autistic, an autistic behavior. Can somebody could make an autistic behavior without being autistic? Se ele chegar ao extremo de não mais se distinguir do que é o autista, if he, if he would uh, arrive at, at the stream of not being distinguishable of what is to be an autistic, a gente vai chegar num limite teórico. We would we would reach our 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 uh, theoretical limit. E a gente ainda hoje não sabe. That we don't know yet today. A gente não sabe se o que a gente é é junto com o corpo. Ou é, ou pode ser fora do corpo. E da mente. We don't know if we, if what we are is together with the body or can be outside of the body. Se eu sou totalmente autista, if no comportamento, totally eu vou dizer que ele é autista. I'm gonna, say, I'm gonna say he's autistic. Se ele pode fingir tanto que daqui a pouco não sabe que está fingindo. He, if he fakes his autism so much that, that he doesn't know that he's faking, he he's autistic. Então, essa a ideia de que a, a conduta vai ter sempre uma parte de aprendizado cultural é inevitável também. The idea that conduct has always a part of cultural apprenticeship, apprenticeship yeah. is, inev is inevitable. Yeah. A gente tem isso com histeria, com obsessão, com depressão, com, depressão, com fobia, com fobia. Bipolar, não é só a bipolaridade. It's not only bipolar. Você pode fazer qualquer um. You can do with any disorder. A outra coisa é, ainda assim, ele é atípico. The other question is, is still he is atypical? É atípico. É atípico. É atípico. He is atypical. Só que eu coloquei aqui uma nota que, claro, que o Michael precisava ler. He wrote a, a footnote that, 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 of course, we're not supposed to read. Where sobre he's a ideia de tipicidade e atipicidade. Explaining what uh, typicity and atypicity means. 
Yeah. Typical, oh. atypical. What it means? Typicality, atypicality would mean there is a footnote on, on his name. Yeah. Quando eu digo típico, when he says typical, eu quero dizer que é uma dada figura, uma figura conceitual abstrata ou imagética abstrata. He said that that is a, 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 an abstract or an imagetic gestalt. Yeah. Que a gente supõe that we suppose que representa that it represents todos os elementos da mesma categoria. All elements in the, within the same category. Isso é escolhido na prática cultural. This is one who chooses in the, in the, in the cultural practice. Não existe na natureza alguma coisa que a gente possa dizer que é típica. It does in the six in nature something that we can say it is typical or atypical. E que contenha todos os traços. And that it contains all the traits dos membros da mesma of the species. members of the same species. Por exemplo. For instance, quando você pensa em um pássaro, would you think of a bird? A gente pensa muito mais num passarinho. We think much more in a small bird, ou mesmo numa galinha, or even in a hen, do que no avestruz. Na nina na hen, avest, avestruz. How do you say? Ostrich. Ostrich. We think more in a small bird than an ostrich. You say cat or bird. Well, but if you're in South Africa, maybe you would think on an ostrich. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it rarely, it rarely. When we think on a mammal, we don't think on a bat. Okay, typical. Typical is, a, is an issue of a convention, cultural convention. Yeah. Agora você pode dizer, bom, esse é típico e pragmaticamente numa certa cultura. Ok, you can say this is typical and pragmaticamente numa certa cultura tem certa limitação. And pragmatically in a, in a given culture has certain limitations. Certo. É por isso, inclusive, that's why in front, a gente procura ver that's why we try to see o quanto pode ajudar a pessoa a, a se aproximar da prática cultural dominante. How one can help to the person to, to, to come closer to the dominant cultural practice. Para que ele seja não apenas bilíngue. In order that he will be not only bilingual. Mas bipragma. But, but by by pragma. So he can pragmatically act in both. Tem a habilidade both dele e habilidade nossa. Okay, to have both abilities. Não existe deficiência na natureza. It doesn't exist deficiency in nature. O Stephen J. Gold, Stephen J. Gold, que é meu intelectual, meu herói intelectual. Ele dizia na natureza, 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 e eu acho que a gente tem que ter uma a ideia de função disfunção normal anormal tem que ser realmente criticada. We we should really criticize notions of a function that's dysfunction normal and abnormal. Mesmo na medicina orgânica ela é contestada. Even in the organic medicine it is it is is it an issue of contention? Is disputed. Imagine in in mental health.